If you turn on any game console, most of them will display a boot logo or introduction sequence. Usually, these intro sequences are there to let the user know that the system is powered on correctly and gotten past its boot process and is ready and waiting for a game to be inserted. And these boot sequences are generally installed inside the console's boot ROM or BIOS. This also wasn't limited to consoles with optical media either. Cartridge-based systems like the Atari Jaguar, Neo Geo AES, and Nintendo's handheld line of systems all the way from the original Game Boy to the current Nintendo Switch have some type of intro that displays when powered on. But let's take a closer look at the Nintendo Game Boy and its intro sequence. The Game Boy doesn't contain a BIOS, rather a small boot ROM. On an original Game Boy, if a cartridge is inserted and the system is powered on, the words Nintendo fall down from the top of the screen into the center, a sound is played, and then the game boots. The Game Boy Color has a variation on this, but it contains the same Nintendo logo. And incidentally, the Game Boy Advance also again has a different variation. This is pretty common with Nintendo handhelds. Powering on a Game Boy without a cartridge inserted results in the Nintendo logo being completely blacked out. This can also happen if the cartridge connection is not making a good contact with the Game Boy itself. This is normally a visual cue to let the user know that they have to clean the connections of the cartridge and try again. What's interesting about this boot process and the Nintendo logo is, is that the logo must be perfectly legible without any pixel errors for the game to boot. And if there are any visual glitches, the Game Boy will just sit at this screen. On first glance, this might seem like a normal cartridge behavior, but there's actually a very clever form of lockout that Nintendo has architected for the Game Boy. To understand this more, since the early days of Nintendo's development of the NES, they were concerned about bootlegs or unlicensed games that were being manufactured. The flood of bad games is what caused the North American video game crash, and Nintendo had set out to put their stamp of approval on any licensed game and make a commitment that it would be a game that would be at a certain level of quality. To do this, they came up with a simple method, known as the 10 NES Lockout. This was a 4-bit Hitachi processor that lived on both the NES console and every officially licensed Nintendo cartridge that ran custom code between them. A simple lock and key paradigm was applied. If the console requested something from the cartridge and it returned what it was expecting, the cartridge would boot. We've covered the 10 NES Lockout chip in a previous episode in quite some detail. The Game Boy hardware was built with simplicity in mind and contained a simple method to stop unlicensed games just like the 10 NES did before it. The Nintendo logo would be installed onto every licensed Nintendo Game Boy cartridge. If the boot ROM detected the logo, the game would simply boot. If it didn't, or if it was tampered with in some way, the game would not boot. So let's dissect and understand how this boot process works. As we know, the Game Boy is an 8-bit handheld, but uses a 16-bit address bus. 16 bits is the equivalent of 64 kilobytes. When the Game Boy is turned on, a special 256-byte program is mapped at address 0 and executed. The hardware sets up the Game Boy's registers, initializes the Game Boy's video RAM, and other things are done in preparation to boot into a game. Each licensed Nintendo Game Boy cartridge contains the Nintendo logo in its ROM. When a cartridge is inserted, it's mapped at address hexadecimal 100. The logo lives in address hexadecimal 104 to hexadecimal 133. These hex values correspond to the Nintendo logo. And to prove this to be true, by using a Game Boy emulator, I can start to edit the hex values at address 104. And as you can see, the logo is being altered. But also notice that the game is not booting into Tetris. Because we are running in an emulator, the concept of dirty cartridge pins doesn't apply. So what's actually going on here? In typical Nintendo fashion, it's quite simple, yet quite elegant. The boot ROM checks for the Nintendo logo twice, once to render it, and the other to validate. So what we're looking at here guys is the 256 bytes of the boot ROM which has been disassembled and I'll walk you through some of the important things that are going on here. The first thing you'll notice 
at address location 7 here. Now this line here is loading the logo data from the cartridge. We said it was at address hexadecimal 104 and preparing it for the display into video RAM. So essentially it's grabbing the logo and if you kind of scroll down you can see that this is essentially just loading up the Nintendo logo and getting it ready to be displayed on screen. And as you can see here, this is where we're changing the vertical scroll registers in a loop and basically just looping and incrementing the logo down the screen until it gets to the middle. And then once it hits the middle, then we end up playing uh, one of these sound effects. There's actually two sounds that get played. They're very kind of close to each other, but there are two sounds that get played. So that is where the logo gets used in the boot ROM. However, there is also a second part of this, and that is the logo check. So there are two pieces of this, and that is further down. And as you can see, at address A8, which is still in the Nintendo boot ROM, there is a copy of the Nintendo logo. This is exactly the same as the logo that we saw at address 104 on the cartridge. So it matches one-to-one -one with what's on the cartridge. And essentially what it's doing here is it's doing a comparison. So it's loading in, again, the cartridge data, or it's pointing to the cartridge data logo, and it's pointing to the address logo at address A8. And essentially it's just doing a comparison. It's comparing each byte one at a time and if there's any differences at all, it locks up. We just basically lock up at that point. But if it passes that, then there is a second check, which does a checksum comparison. And if that passes, then the game boots up. Otherwise, it locks up. So this is important to note that there are two separate logo checks that are in the boot ROM itself. So how did unlicensed manufacturers of Game Boy cartridges come up with a way to have their logo on the game and have the game boot? Now you might be thinking this is simple enough. All you need to do is ensure that the checksum routine returns zero and allows for the game to boot up in every situation. But the problem is the boot ROM itself is not modifiable. It's not a part of any flash and there's no easy way to access it and modify any bytes. Okay, so you're probably wondering at this point, is this actually copy protection? Because all that simply needs to occur for a game to boot is to ensure that the Nintendo logo is applied to any cartridge for it to run. The problem with this approach is that the unlicensed producer of cartridges would need to incorporate the Nintendo logo into their game, which in theory would commit trademark infringement. This was Nintendo's way of catching out game makers who were bootlegging games. This isn't the first time that this approach has happened either. Nintendo's competition, Sega, was in a very similar situation on the Sega Genesis with the trademark security system check. Accolade games would work in the TMSS screen into their games. Sega would take them to court, filing trademark infringements and unfair competition. But Sega would lose the court case and Accolade won on the grounds of fair use. Nintendo's logo check was mainly aimed at Taiwan. But trademark laws are complicated and vary from region to region. So it's difficult to say how effective this approach was. And with Sega losing to Accolade in US court, this effort may not have been effective as they would have hoped. Still, Nintendo's logo check made some companies come up with a way around the trademark. And they would do this by altering the Nintendo logo with their own, circumventing the issue and any possible lawsuit. But how was this possible when we said earlier that changing one byte of the logo would cause the Game Boy to freeze? We said that the Game Boy logo is read twice, the first time to display it and the second to validate. The custom logo is read in for the first read and this is where the logo is displayed. And then the Nintendo logo is quickly swapped back in before the validation occurs. This fools the boot ROM into believing that nothing was tampered with. This process, however, won't work purely in code. It requires precision timing to make sure that the Nintendo logo is applied at the correct time. And this is done with the help of some hardware. YouTuber Stack Smashing made a great video on this recently. With the help of an FPGA circuit, he was able to modify the boot logo and boot into Tetris. It does pose the question, why wouldn't Nintendo just incorporate the 10 NES lockout chip on the Game Boy hardware? We can only speculate but I believe the answer is cost. You see, the Game Boy was meant to be as cheap as possible, with both the handheld and its games being a lot lower priced than the NES. 
This meant that adding a CIC chip to each of the games as well as the hardware would increase the cost significantly. But there were some unlicensed games that were released for the Game Boy mainly from Taiwan that contained custom boot logos as well. They exist, but the number of bootlegs that were made were quite low. Of course these days, bootlegs and reproduction cartridges have flooded the market, and almost all of them just have the Nintendo logo applied. Incidentally, the Game Boy Color uses the almost exact same boot process as the original Game Boy. The Nintendo logo lives in the same region on the cartridge and can be modified in the same way. The same protection is applied if the logo doesn't match the boot ROM or if the checksum fails. In the end, this method was just another thing that made the Game Boy what it is. Simple yet effective anti-piracy. Nintendo knew that they couldn't stop the bootleggers, but would potentially expose them for trademark violations. And this would be enough to keep many of them away. So the next time you turn on your Game Boy and see that logo scrolling down your screen, keep in mind that there is a lot more going on here than meets the eye. So there you have it guys, that is the secrets of the Nintendo logo found on the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color handheld systems. It's a interesting story to tell for you guys and I hope you guys enjoyed this and let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Well guys, we are going to leave it here. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.